And as we think about salvation, that's how we need to think about it as well, is that we are saved, redeemed, salvaged for a purpose. We're saved from something for something. Redemption has its purpose in recreating us to be what God created us to be. So the goal of salvation is not just so that you can go to, go to heaven when you die. If that's the goal, we've missed it. and live up to the calling that we have in Christ. It is a high calling that we have, and I pray that we would always be reminded of it and be able to go forth in boldness. So it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, it's exciting to be able to have the opportunity to share with, with everyone here tonight and, and on Zoom across the world. Uh, we have been very blessed in our time thus far here in, in Massachusetts with all the brothers and sisters. And obviously it's been, it's been a strange time with it just being winter, but then also add on top of that coronavirus, which makes all kinds of complications. But uh, we are very blessed and just thankful for uh, the time that we've had to be able to, uh, to be encouraged and build relationships. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I want to <clears throat> I want to uh, talk about the reality of God's kingdom and more, more specifically the new humanity, the reality of the new humanity within God's kingdom. I think we talk a lot about the kingdom of God and its present reality and that's a something that's a distinction for us as Christians and, uh, and what we believe, that, that we have a present reigning king being Jesus, and he has a present and very real kingdom that we are a part of. Um, but what does that practically mean for you and for me as Christians? How does that new humanity truly affect us or impact us, and do we actually um, allow it to impact us and affect us the way that it should. So that's what I want to talk about this evening. I've had an opportunity uh, while I've been here in the States to do a little bit of work on the side, and that has been uh, a blessing in very many ways, but it's also allowed me a lot of opportunity to reflect and think about, um, about the work of God in my own life and, and, and in the lives of others here in this room and those of you across the world is that when, when we meet Jesus, we, we usually aren't all cleaned up and, and uh, you know, we haven't received that new humanity. There's a whole reason why we need, have the necessity for the new birth and for the re redemptive work of Christ in our life, and our heart, and how that should affect everything around us. And as I think about salvation and the work of salvation, uh, it's, it's a process. It's not event oriented. There are obviously certain events, there are starting points, there are major events that happen, uh, but it is a process that we all go through and that God is continuing to work in, with, and through us as a people. And so as I think about um, this house, you know, whoever the designer or creator was, if you can look at the, the image there, and some of you don't have the, the image with you, but if you're able to see the image there, in the top, the top three pictures, the place is, is a wreck. I mean, you see, you know, floors are torn up, um, the walls are in disarray, there's, there's just all kinds of, of trash and destruction in those first three pictures, and I don't think that that's probably what the original builder had intended for this house. You know, I don't think somebody originally built this and said, wow, this is, this is what I picture is eventually a whole bunch of trash and clutter and destruction and torn down walls and floors. That's not probably what they had in mind when they were thinking about this house. They probably had thoughts of, of family and community and, and meals and, and life happening in this home. And so, Many times our lives can be like that, you know, whether it be through abuse that, that we have inflicted on ourselves or abuse that we've suffered at the hands of others, but our lives can be just filled with this, 
this process of being torn down and ripped apart as a result of the situations and circumstances that we've been uh, exposed to, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And the work that God wants to do in our hearts and in our lives is to come and restore and rebuild and renew all of those things. And so, so hopefully that's a glimpse of that as we look at the, the bottom half of the picture there. <clears throat> is that the work that God is doing is to restore those things and bring them back to a place where they can be used and, and have benefit. Now, there's, gonna, there's still going to take some work and some effort. The, the house is going to have to still be maintained. You're going to have to still work at it to keep it in that condition. It's not just a set it and forget it thing. And that's why we need to think about salvation as a process and not just an event. Tearing out all of these walls and putting new floors in was a long time process, not something that happened in a matter of minutes or hours or overnight. And so, so hopefully we can think about salvation in that respect. One of the things that this last year has given the opportunity for myself and uh, many of our brothers and sisters back in Uganda, uh, it's given us a lot of time to think about our ministries, to think about our fishing ponds and the things that we are involved in and uh, be able to, to put some, uh, some things in place so that we can be more effective, especially as we think about what the world is going to look like post-coronavirus. And I think we're all wondering the same thing. You know, what, what, what is this next year, 2021? We've just, we've just entered into a new year. Is it going to look the same as 2020 or... <clears throat> Or are we going to, um, to be able to, to move back to some form of normal? Or are we going to have to adapt to what we think is going to be the new normals? And some of the things that we've talked about, um, we came up with this acronym, and it's called CIRT, uh, S-I-R-T. And so the S first starts with strategical. And I'm going to go a little bit more, um, I'm going to tie this into today's lesson as we think about the, the new humanity. And I want to, ultimately what I want to do is remind us of our calling that we have in Christ. Um, because it seems like Paul is continually doing that with his churches. He's continually reminding them of their hope. He's reminding them of the calling with which they were called and to live up to that calling. And that's my hope tonight is, to, is for myself and also for, for all of us. So the first S, like I said, is strategical. Anytime that you want to achieve something, you, you need a strategy. You know, if you have, if you have two, two individuals or two teams competing at something, the one who goes in, into it with a strategy is probably going to be the one, unless, unless the talent, by, by pure talent, the other one is able to win. Um, but usually you need to go into something with a strategy. And we know the enemy has a strategy, but do we, as Christians, are we looking to the truths in God's word? Are we putting our heads and our talent together to strategize about how we can overcome the enemy and his devices? Are we putting our heads together and strategizing on how we can be effective at building the kingdom of God? So strategical is the first S. The I is intentional. And, and some of these have obviously some, some overlap a little bit in, def, in definition because obviously if you put a strategy in place, you're, you're a person who's trying to be intentional. But actively thinking about being intentional in every opportunity, making the most of it, and being intentional in those times to be a witness, to be what God has called us to be, to, to see it as an opportunity to live up to that calling, sometimes even in the mundane of tasks are all opportunities to be a witness for Christ and be intentional with our time, with our words, and with our thoughts. The next is relational. <clears throat> so strategic, intentional, and now relational. As we think about evangelism specifically, uh, I have found in my experience the, the most effective form of, of evangelism has happened from the basis of a relationship. And usually around a table, either drinking coffee or tea or sharing in a meal, but essentially it happens in the context of some form of relationship and connection. And so wanting to prioritize being relational with people and actually seeing people as people, seeing them as image bearers and restoring them. 
thinking about going back to that that picture of the house that I showed at the beginning. You know, the original um, creator or builder of that house had a had a vision, had a purpose in mind, and we know for sure it wasn't the way that the top picture looked, where it was torn up and, and in destruction and in disarray. <clears throat> but he, but but the same thing with God. If we look and see everyone around us as an opportunity to restore someone back to that, not only just a rightful relationship, but, but to be able to rightly reflect the image of God and seeing that as a be, being a relational uh, aspect. And then the last one is how we're going to measure, and that's transformational. Are we truly seeing transformation happening? Are we seeing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. It is something that we are supposed to pray. It's something Jesus told us to pray, but it's 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 a twofold. It's the prayer that we pray and we're also the answer of that. Because as we obey Jesus, as we seek his kingdom, we're going to see transformation and change happen around us. And so that's the way to know are we is our strategy working? Are we being intentional? Are we are we being relational in these opportunities? And and the proof is going to be are we seeing transformation happening? So I want to go to Ephesians chapter four. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the whole chapter here. Let me Okay, so Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now, just to give a little bit of uh, context here, <clears throat> Paul talks about earlier in this letter that he's, he's writing to, to Gentiles predominantly. Um, and here we see that he's, he's wanting to remind them uh, of who they are. It's, it really does seem to be a letter focused on identity. You're no longer who you used to be. And here's who you are in the Messiah, in King Jesus. Here's the reality, and here's the new identity that you've taken on. And so hopefully we can see a bit of that come out as we read through Ephesians chapter 4 here. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with, law, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one, excuse me, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he, as he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, testifying in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to walk 
to work all uncleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard and heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is necessary, uh, but what is good for necessary edification, that, in, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So here we can see truly the practical outworking of the gospel. The, the, the practical outworking of the life of Christ in the Gentiles. Don't, don't be like the rest of the Gentiles. Let, let him who lie now be a person of truth. The one who stole, he steals no more. And rather, rather than just not stealing, now he's going the next mile and he's, he's, he's now one who's, who's giving out. And so we can see a contrast there and how this is truly working itself out practically in the everyday life of those that Paul is writing to in this letter. Sorry, it's not. There we go. So telling people what they need to do is not Paul's concern here. He's not setting out to just say, okay, here it is. Here's the do's and the don'ts. Um, stay, stay away from these things, and, and here's what, what needs to be done. Uh, he's truly concerned about their behavior, and that behavior itself is a sign of who they really are. And it's our, it's our identity that has to change as we come into Christ. We were this old person in the old lust, the old desires, but you have not so learned Christ Christ are, is, when Christ is your life, those things are no longer your identity. They're no longer who you are. Because our identity is no longer in ourselves, but in the kingdom of God, we will now behave differently than before. Um, this is just a natural conclusion. Um, nobody meets Jesus and walks away the same. Nobody that we read in the Gospels, and I think I would hope that all of us in here would, would also echo that and say, Amen. I didn't meet Jesus and walk away the same person I was before. Because when we see the Gospels and we see people who, who have this encounter with the Messiah, they, they do not walk away the same. The woman at the well meets Jesus and, and rejoices over the fact that this man is able to tell her everything she ever did wrong. Like, Really, like, why would, why would that be something to be so excited about? I mean, I don't know that I would walk down the road and meet somebody and he's able to say, here's everything you've ever done wrong in your life, and I would go walk away rejoicing about that, unless it was the Messiah. And so everyone who meets Jesus and is confronted with who they are and who he is walks away changed. Paul on the road to Damascus is not the same man, Right? He goes from Saul to being Paul, the one who persecuted the church to the one who is now building it for Christ's sake. And as he says, the one who is chained because of the gospel. <clears throat> so the new standards that we see in this kingdom, lying, exchanges for truth, anger. And it's not just saying, hey, look, it's wrong if you have anger. You need to deal with that. Deal with that anger. Now, obviously, if your actions as a result of your anger are causing sin and destruction and causing harm to others, that's a problem. But anger is an emotion. It's, it's something that 
we have. And, and Paul here is, is not saying that the emotion of anger itself is a bad, wrong, or sinful thing. But rather, the, the difference in the kingdom is that we resolve those conflicts. We're willing to push into those hard things. We're not just, gonna, we're not just going to walk away and, and let it stew. We're going to actually confront those things, though they be uncomfortable, and we're going to work towards resolving them because that's how God works. God doesn't just want to, to throw things out. He wants to resolve problems, and we, as his image bearers, are supposed to be problem solvers. I think that's something that's inherent in us. We see a problem, let's work together to try to fix it. I think that's, that's a characteristic of who God is, and I think it comes out in us, and I think it's, a, it's a, one of the markers of the new humanity. The one who is stealing is now working and laboring so that he can provide for the needs of others. Uh, no longer having rotten or corrupt speech, rather we have a speech that's seasoned with salt. And it's, it's, it's tremendous to think about how our words can actually be something that gives grace to someone else. Like, I don't know if you caught that in there, but it says, speak in a way that you may give grace to the hearers. Like, we have the ability to speak and to do things in a way that can actually impart God's grace into somebody's life. That's a tremendous privilege, but that's also a tremendous responsibility. Like, a, it's a privilege and a responsibility. So we, we have the potential to, to either tear down or build up. <clears throat> and hatred is turned... Is, is exchanged for love. And love here, um, it actually uses, I think throughout this, this chapter, it uses the word uh, agape, which we just had a little bit ago. You know, we just sat down and we, we had our love feast. We had our time of agape, which was a time of sharing. It was a time of if there was some conflict to, to talk those things out and to resolve them. It was a time to actually be open and, and come in to a place where we feel like it's family and we can be loved and we can be open and we can share and we can allow God's grace into that part of our life. And we see that Jesus is continually walking and calling others into that kind of mindset, into that way of, of being loved, feeling and knowing that we are loved, and showing others that they're also loved and capable of loving. So the, the new family orientation. So these are the things that we, we, we circle around. We, we should be centering our life, our Christian life around. And the first one is worship. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of these in brief. Uh, but worship, worship, resurrection, holiness, love, and vocation. And this, I actually, um, this is N.T. Wright is where I get some of these from. And I think, I think this is a very accurate way of, of thinking about this, about how we as the new humans in Jesus Christ should orient our lives, being worship, resurrection, holiness, love, and then vocation. Ultimately, what is our calling now that we've been renewed in Jesus? And so worship. I have a quote here. The one who worships God in this way is brought into a new community becoming a more complete human being by reflecting the image of the one true God. Everything we do, if done for our king, is an act of worship. Work now, now has meaning. Service now has meaning. Raising a family now has meaning. Everything that we can put our hand to can be an act of worship if we allow it to be. We have the opportunity to, to, uh, to, be, to show gratitude, to show thankfulness towards God for the opportunities. I, and I'm sure even for a lot of our, our mothers who have, you know, either, uh, uh, either you're a young family or you're a mother with a larger family, but each of them has varying degrees of roles and responsibility and pressures that are, that are pulling on, on you. But in those times, those are times that can be filled with with worship, even in, even in the, the difficult and, and uh, challenging times as it is uh, with, with raising a family, those can still be opportunities and times uh, for worship and ways that we can show a heart of gratitude 
through those things. So resurrection, the present reality for the new humanity. I think a lot of times we put, we take resurrection and we put it on a shelf of being out there. That, okay, resurrection, okay, yeah, I kind of understand it, but really resurrection, it's something that, that's going to happen at the end. And there is a, a fullness or a completion to come about in the final resurrection and what that means. But resurrection, just like the kingdom, just like the new humanity, just like the, the sa saving and redeeming work that Christ does is a present reality for us. Resurrection is, is meant to be experienced now. Uh, when you read Paul, when you read the New Testament, you recognize that they're walking in the power of the resurrection, that everything is centered around the reality of Jesus' resurrection, and that means something not for the future. Yes, it does, but it actually means something right here, right now, and that there's power in that, that we've died and we rise up a new creation in Christ, and that has emboldened us and empowered us to be the things that we've been called to be. If we turn over to Ephesians, let's look uh, there real quick. Ephesians chapter 1. So Ephesians chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 15 here. Paul says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. So once again, he's, he's bringing us back to this calling and this hope that we have in Christ. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places? To me, this sounds like Paul's viewing this as right here, right now. That this, this Christ being raised and seated has major implications for the here and for the now. Verse 20 again, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the right, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. So, so even here he's saying not only here, but also there. Implications now, implications then. 22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Continuing to two, and you, okay, so now, now think about what Paul is saying. He's, Paul is, is magnifying the work of Jesus here. He's magnifying the work of God in Christ who, who was able to raise the Messiah and what that means and now seated, seated him in the heavenlies, giving him all dominion, all power over principalities, and then he brings it back down to us, the recipients. And he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is resurrection language here. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, right? I mean, that's just, once again, it's like, this is who we were, but then we meet Jesus. And here he's saying, this is who you used to be, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. For God so loved the world, right? That he gave. With great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and, and raised up together and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sounds like Paul's speaking in a way where he's sitting in the heavenlies with Jesus as he's writing this, right? 
Like he's, there's a present and actual reality for the believer here. That in the age, ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So Christ set into motion the new age, the beginning of the end, that will one day come to its final com completion in the resurrection. So if the road to, the true, to true humanity is true worship, the end goal of God's renewed humanity is, of course, the resurrection. So it's an already but not yet. And it's a present reality for us that we can walk in. Okay, the next marker of, uh, that we're looking at in the new humanity here is God's is holiness, God's transformation of the new humanity. In the time between the beginning and the end of human, uh, of, of, of the creation story and of humans, we see that there's ongoing renewal and separation and, and a calling that's happening with God's people. Uh, this happens through participation. It's not just we, when, as you read the Old Testament, as you read throughout the scriptures, it's not just this blanket pronouncement. It comes through participation, that God's covenant people, uh, to be a part of the covenant people, it's about accepting and participating in that work that God has for us. Uh, holiness is a, is a necessary character, characterization of a renewed humanity in Christ. So this happens through participation. God's grace and our participation equals progress towards holiness. If we think about the story of Noah, if we think about the story of the Egyptians, uh, of is the Israelites coming out of Egypt, uh, and we think about those particular stories, we, we are reminded of this fact that Salvation, redemption, and holiness, all of these things are an active, ongoing participation with Yahweh. Noah is called to, to come and build a boat, right? God's going to save those who enter into this ark, but Noah's got to participate, right? God's not going to do the building. God's going to give you the plans, the design, and he's going to do the saving, but you've it's, it's a give and a take, right? There's participation that's expected. When, when God... Um, comes to, to redeem and free his people, liberate his people from the bondage of, of uh, Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. God comes in and through a series of, of plagues demonstrates his might and his power and he has expectations for his covenant people. On the, especially with the last plague, as we look at uh, where he's going to send the, uh, the, 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 the death angel to, to pass over the people. And it's very specific. God, God wants them to, to be ready with their staff in their hand, shoes on their feet. He wants, it comes down to how the meal itself is supposed to be prepared, what kind of lamb can be killed, and, and spreading the blood on the doorpost. Why do you think God expects those things? My personal opinion is that it's because God wants participation. He wants those who are willing to say yes, even if it doesn't make sense, but those who are willing to say yes, I want to participate in what God is doing, even if it doesn't make sense. And so I'm going to find this lamb. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to spread the blood over the doorpost. I'm going to, I'm going to combine these herbs with these herbs, and I'm going to boil this, and I'm going to, you know, and it's all these things that may seem strange and even distant to us, but it's a picture of participation. I mean, I, I'm always reminded, I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder how it would go for the Israelite, the Hebrew who, who goes, you know, maybe he goes to his neighbor, he's like, you know, we've seen God working already in all these plagues. I think he knows who the Egyptians are and who the, the, the Hebrews are. I think we look different enough. I don't think we really need to do that. So, I, I, you know, I believe in Yahweh, you know, in my heart. I've seen, I've seen him do this work, but I, I don't think we really need to, to actually spread the blood on the doorpost. Like, I think he's just, yeah, it's just a formality. 
God's not really looking for that. He's really, he knows I'm, he knows I'm one of his. He knows I'm not an Egyptian. How do you think it's going to go for that Hebrew? Not good. Not so well. Right? Because we're not, that, that Hebrew's not participating with God in the redemptive work that he wants to do in and among and with his people. And so hopefully we can see holiness as that. Um, when, you, when you read uh, Paul's writing uh, to Romans, to the Romans there, and, and he's going, he's talking about baptism and dying to the old self and, and being raised up with Christ. And it, it, he talks about that we were slaves of sin. And now that we've been set free from sin, we actually become slaves of righteousness, of righteousness right? And so there's an exchange, just like we're seeing in, in, in Ephesians here. You were liars, now you're speakers of truth. You stole, still no more, and instead be someone who's benevolent. There's this exchange of identity that's happening. And there's a fruit, he says. The, the fruit that you get leads to holiness. And so once again, even holiness is not just this pronouncement stamp that gets put on somebody. It's a process. A process of active participation in the things of God and allowing that work to, to continue to renew us and redeem us on a day-to-day -day basis with the things that we're involved in. And the end of that, the end of that that Paul talks about is eternal life. All right, so love is the next marker. It's the coherence of the new humanity. It's what binds us and ties us together. And it's really ultimately supposed to be the, the thing that, that marks us to the world around us. You will know them by their love. <clears throat> Sadly, this has been a major thing I think that has been missing throughout a lot, uh, a lot of groups throughout the church throughout missions in the world. I mean, if we think about what are supposedly called Christian nations, you know, it, it, it's if we think about 1994 Rwanda, if we think about South, recent events in South Sudan, these supposed Christian nations who they don't allow the gospel and the kingdom of God to tear down their old, their old allegiances, their old loyalties because they're, they're still wanting to be attached to their old identity rather than taking on the new identity. And when, when, in the new humanity, when you have a new identity in Christ, you have a new family, you have a new tribe, you have a new nation. But many people neglect that. And instead, we allow our earthly alliances and allegiances to be the thing that's, that, that dictate what we do and don't do. And so if love is supposed to be a marker for Christianity, you're not going to have one tribe slaughtering another tribe, even though you're both supposed to be Christian. But my allegiance and loyalty to my tribe is higher than that. In God's kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom, it cannot be. It has, love has to be a marker. If we think about uh, the prayer that, that the Israelites continually prayed in Deuteronomy 6, it comes out. And also, uh, Jesus uh, says when he's, he's asked about what are the greatest commandments, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. But are we doing that? Do we, are we intentional about seeing our fellow humans, if we, even if we disagree with them, as seeing them as created in the image of God. I have a, um, a quote here I want to, um, or not a quote, just a very short story I want to read. Um, it actually comes from a little book that we came across. Uh, we were discussing Mr. Rogers last night, and so I picked up this, this little book um, that was sitting in the living room that has some of his writings. It's called The Words, uh, excuse me, The World According to Mr. Rogers. Um, and I was struck by this one story in here that was, um, it really spoke to me, and so I thought I would read it here. It says, Helen Ross was a good friend who taught teachers, doctors, and psychiatrists, and consulted with profess professionals working with children and families all over the world. 
She was one of the great people of our age in the understanding of the dynamic development of human beings. After one operation for cancer and some subsequent therapy, Helen chose to refuse treatment when her cancer reappeared. One day when I visited her, I found Helen very frail yet interested in all that I had to tell her about our television work with, a Pittsburgh, with, uh, with her Pittsburgh friends. Some of the time I just held her hand and we said nothing. We didn't have to. After one of those silences, Helen said to me, do you ever pray for people, Fred? Of course I do. So I said, dear God, encircled, encircle us with thy love wherever we may be. And Helen replied, that's what it is, isn't it? It's love. That's what it's all about. Helen was, in light, uh, was 88 when she died. She spent most of her adult life working at understanding the complexities of human growth and development, and her summation of life was that love is what it's all about. And it's interesting to think about that seems to be Jesus' perspective. That seems to be God's perspective. When you read the writings, with the love with which he loved us, God so loved the world. Jesus is calling us to love our enemies, love our neighbors, love those around us. It's a high calling. It's not easy. We think it, I think in many ways we think, oh, well, that's simple. We can, we can love those around us. But it's, it's actually not. It's something we have to continue to strive for day in and day out. Paul's focus, obviously, is Jews and Gentiles uniting in this family and the conflict that that's bringing and how he's going to help to unite these churches in that aspect. And I, I think that we're not, um, even though we can, we can read that and look and think that we have the answers, many times we don't even in our day and age, sadly. We've, we may not be looking at a, an aspect and a separation of Jew and Gentile, but we have pretty, uh, a whole list of other things that, that separate us as people. And, and I'm sure we could insert all kinds of other uh, names and barriers and walls and, uh, that we end up building that keep us from viewing each other as brothers and sisters and viewing us as uh, created in God's image. But ultimately the goal is every tribe and every tongue in unity under this love that God has. Another quote, I think I mentioned it just a little bit ago, but this is from Mr. Rogers. The greatest thing we can do is to let people know that they are loved and capable of loving. That's, our, that's one of the roles that we play, is to let people know who God is and that he loves them and that they too are also capable of loving others. Vocation. Now we get to the calling. What, what does vocation mean? This, this is our calling. This is our, our function, our role, what we were created to do and to be in following Jesus. It's the zeal of the new humanity. We have a new goal and calling in life when we come into Christ. <clears throat> Proper dominion and representation of God is exercised once again. So what does this practically include? Well, obviously it practically includes sharing the good news, sharing the gospel with others, talking to them, living out the kingdom life, whether in our home, whether at the store, whether in, in our workplaces, on the bus, wherever it may be, living out the teachings of Jesus, valuing life in all phases, in all stages, valuing life, taking good care of our bodies and the earth around us, and allowing Jesus' teachings to, to impact everything that we think, everything that we say, and everything that we do. <clears throat> the, if you read Genesis, um, the vocation is pretty clear, uh, right? When we, when we see God has created humanity, made him in his image, and he's, he gives them a very clear vocation. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion, right? And I don't think that that has changed. I think that's, that is still, I think we can go back to that and say, okay, here's what, what has happened. God created humanity 
We now have seen the dehumanizing effects of sin in the world. God has sent Jesus to be the true human so that we can once again be renewed or restored back to the state of what it means to be God's human in this world that he's created for us. And so the, the calling and vocation that we see in Genesis is not at all far from what we are supposed to be striving towards as we look at Jesus and as we think about our lives. So being fruitful, we know that Jesus says that if we abide in, in him, in Jesus, as the vine, what's the result? We will bear much fruit, right? Abide in me and I'll abide in you. I am the true vine, you are the branches. Every branch that, that abides in me bears fruit. Now, as we know, that bearing, being fruitful and, and bearing that fruit also is going to come with some pruning, right? That means there's going to be confrontation. There's going to be times of uncomfortableness. There's going to be times of, of persecution or suffering or what, whatever that pruning may be. When you lop off a limb, it's probably not going to be nice. But its, it's result is so that we can be more fruitful in the things that we put our hand to. Multiplying. I think the, the easy conclusion of what it means to multiply, whether we're looking at the garden or what, whether we're looking at um, as, as Christians, is ultimately making disciples. Not just making more human beings, but actually making true human beings that are created in the image of God and, and bringing them back into right relationship, restoring them and helping them to go through that process of salvation so that they can be a renewed humanity in Jesus. Fill the earth. And I think we have plenty of opportunity to do this, although it may seem challenging and difficult in the political um, temperature and season that we're living in with coronavirus and all these, all these, the, the exteriors are always going to be there. They're always just going to take on different shapes and forms. But we can be those who are filling the earth with love, with joy, peace, and ultimately blessing. Because that's what's lost in the garden story. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue. And as a result of Adam and Eve's choice to disobey God and to take of the tree, curse enters in. And then we see God's love is still for, he still wants to work in, with, and through humans. He doesn't just rip the piece of paper up and throw it to the side and say, well, let me, that plan didn't work. Let me start with another. God, God's design and desires to continue to work in, with, and through his human creatures. And so the story goes on to show how God is going to reestablish his blessing. And he starts with a man and his family being Abraham. And then from there, it grows into a nation um, and, and on and on. And then finally, we see, even though Israel fails, Jesus is the one who is the resolution to Israel's story, succeeds and calls us into that blessing. And, and Paul says the gospel that was preached to Abraham it might, that might be a bit challenging for us because for so many, the gospel is just the, the uh, Christ and him crucified. And by no means at all do I want to diminish that. But Paul himself says that the gospel that was preached to Abraham was about being a blessing to all the families, all the nations of the earth. And so that, that's a high calling. How can we bless our enemies? How can we bless those around us? How can we bless our families and our neighbors and our, our co-workers or our, our fellow students, whatever it may do, be? The next one is subdue. Well, to subdue something is to, is to, bring, to bring it into control uh, is one way of thinking about subdue. Um, but I think we can, we can think about overcoming evil with good. Jesus calls us to not just turn the other cheek, but to overcome, or he tells us to turn the other cheek, and he also tells us to overcome evil with good. Not just to stand back and say, okay, I, it's evil, I can't, I have, to, I have to stay over here. We're supposed to, it's an active pursuit. We actually overcome it with good, with his teachings, with service to him. And then lastly is dominion. And it seems like Paul puts it this way, follow me as I follow Christ. 
Scripture says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus is the one who has reclaimed the rightful place on the throne. And he says, come and follow me. And Paul, picking up that mantle going on, saying, now, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Because my eyes are set on the target. They're set on the prize, and I'm going this direction. Come in line and follow me. And I hope that we all can say that. I know we, we all want to, to point people to Jesus, and we, we should, but can we, can we also stand like, like the Apostle Paul and say, follow me as I follow Christ? That's, I think, a challenge for us to think and, and say, can I say that? And can we be that example to where, we're, where our lives, not just our words, but our lives and everything about us are pointing to the risen King? Is the resurrection truly taking hold in a practical way in our everyday life right here, right now, as we await the final completion at the, at the, the, uh, the final resurrection? One more illustration, if you have your, your, com- your computers or can see on the screen, is another way of thinking about the redemptive work of God and the work of Christ, <clears throat> is that the creator of this vehicle probably never imagined it sitting in a field. He probably didn't build this thinking of, you know what? One day this is going to be rusted and beat up. Its tires are going to be, you know, no engine in it. It's just going to be this dead weight sitting in the middle of a field. I don't think that's what the original creator or designer of that had in mind when he created it. It was created for a purpose, right? Right. This truck was created to, to take people places, maybe to, to pick up goods, to transport things. Whatever it was, it, it had a purpose. And as we think about salvation, that's how we need to think about it as well, is that we are saved, redeemed, salvaged for a purpose. We're saved from something for something. Redemption has its purpose in recreating us to be what God created us to be. So the goal of salvation is not just so that you can go to, go to heaven when you die. If that's the goal, we've missed it. Rather, it's for heaven itself to be manifested in us. That's the goal of salvation, is to renew, restore, and recreate you so that now heaven can be a true experience on earth as it is in heaven. That's the Lord's prayer. And that's the reality of the new humanity in the kingdom of God. Salvation's purpose is to transform us into what we have been created to be and then to enable us to live out our vocation in the present world as a renewed humanity in Jesus with a new identity, with Christ being the head. So that's the calling. That's what we are, I hope, being reminded of as we, as we enter into this new year. As we enter into 2021, I hope that this can be an encouragement and a challenge in many ways for us to think about, okay, how can we live out this renewed humanity life in, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our businesses, as we're, as we're traveling, whatever the case may be. How can we be strategic with our ways in which we go about making disciples and, and discipling others? How can we be intentional with all of the opportunities that we have around us to make the most of each of those opportunities? How can we be focused on building relationships and seeing people as being created in the image of God and valuing them as people and ultimately see transformation happening around us in our communities and in our our places that we go. So with that, I'll close and we'll have a prayer and then I'll I'll turn the time back over to uh, Brother Finney. Gracious Father in heaven, we, we want to come before you now. God, we thank you for your redemption. We thank you, Father, that you do love us. And Father, I pray that each one of us here in this room and each one of those out there on the Zoom call, that we can be reminded 
of that love. That, lo- that that love would, would en- encircle us right here, right now, in this time to, to even know the depths of that love. We can't even begin to describe it. And so, Father, I just pray that you would manifest that uh, in an abundant way in, in each and every person's life uh, this evening and this week and in, the, in the, the days to come as we are have entered into this new year. Father, give us a, a zeal and a passion for the calling that we have in Christ to walk worthy of that calling and see that the, the tremendous opportunity that we have to be what you created us to be that you haven't just you haven't just restored us to put a to to be able to park us in a garage but you've restored us so that we can go and be equipped and enabled to do and be what you created us to be to be fruitful to multiply to fill the earth to subdue it and to exercise your rule and your reign over this world so help us to fight the good fight father Thank you for our time tonight, and may you um, uh, bless us as we all uh, want to go forward and seek your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.